When Vince McMahon assumed full control of the World Wrestling Federation in 1982, he had little interest in abiding by the boundaries of the North American Wrestling Territory system. McMahon's vision was that of a national expansion for the WWF, and the prospect of cable television provided him the avenue to deliver his New York-style product to fans outside the WWF's northeastern base. But while McMahon did find one cable outlet to broadcast the WWF, he wasn't content with just beaming out his wares on that one channel. He wanted to be the only game in town. And through ruthless means, Vince pushed forward with his McManifest destiny. Professional wrestling has long made use of television to aid its bigger endeavors. Even in the years before pay-per-view became king, the function of TV wrestling was to give viewers a small taste of the larger meal. Through simple angles as well as matches that didn't give away too much and a steady amount of hype, the television product was designed to drive fans to buy tickets to the big monthly show, where all the major stars would be on hand. Professional wrestling had aired on all of the major American networks during the golden age of the 1950s, but the inevitable decline in popularity led to relegation, pushing wrestling to lower frequency stations in a territory's local market. For promoters, this wasn't the worst possible scenario, seeing as these independent stations needed cheap programming to fill the hours, and studio wrestling wasn't all that expensive to produce. All a territory really needed was that local forum to tell fans when and where the big cards would take place, as well as a means to entice them with a few bites of the overall product. But the world of TV was ever expanding. By 1968, 6.5% of Americans were wired for this little thing called cable television, but it would take some time for cable to reach a wider base, the number of cable recipients only increasing to 7.5% a decade later. Of course, tempting options like ESPN, MTV, and A&E, among a slew of others, hadn't been launched yet. Preceding the rollout of these diverse channel options was the national expansion of an Atlanta-based independent TV station, owned by radio and TV magnate Ted Turner. Previously known as WTCG on a local level, the call letters were changed to WTBS in 1976, when the Atlanta feed was beamed out to an additional 24,000 TV viewers in the Midwestern and Southeastern United States. This made Georgia Championship Wrestling, which had aired on WTCG since 1972, the first wrestling organization to receive a national cable TV contract. There was apparently a little bit of friction with other promoters who felt that Georgia owner Jim Barnett was trying to supersede the National Wrestling Alliance by taking his territory national. While Barnett disputed that idea, the fact remains that Turner's ambitious move to create a national superstation out of his local TV outlet, which just so happened to broadcast a popular weekend wrestling program, demonstrated just how awing the power of cable could be to those on the outside looking in. One individual primed to make use of this growing field of cable TV was Vince McMahon. In June of 1982, McMahon purchased all of the WWF's ownership stock for himself, buying out stockholders Gorilla Monsoon, Arnold Scarland, company secretary Phil Zacco, and his own father, Vincent J. McMahon. This was hardly a low-risk venture on Vincent K.'s part. If he defaulted on any promised payouts to the former stockholders over the next year, payouts that totaled $1 million, McMahon would forfeit his shares back to the four men. In other words, Vince needed to make good on his vision quickly, or he risked losing the deed to the house. At the dawn of 1983, McMahon began a westward expansion of WWF television into the state of Ohio, securing a spot on station WAKR 23 in Akron. Soon after, McMahon started running his own events in the Buckeye State. This was significant because Georgia promoter Ole Anderson ran Ohio regularly, and he hadn't given McMahon, whose WWF still operated under the NWA umbrella, any sort of blessing to tread upon his domain. 
Anderson was understandably irked by McMahon blatantly ignoring the territorial boundaries, and his anger came spilling out in August of 1983 at the annual National Wrestling Alliance convention in Las Vegas. In a room filled with NWA promoters and territorial stars, Anderson raged at McMahon, furious over Vince's push onto his turf. He threatened to retaliate, vowing to bring his own cards to McMahon's Pennsylvania strongholds. As Bret Hart, who attended the meeting along with his father Stu, recalled, Everyone started arguing, and there were cries of order. Then Vince stood up in the midst of the commotion and simply walked out. In that moment, I was witness to the beginning of the end of promoters such as my dad and regional territories such as Stampede, though none of us recognized that at the time. The bigger bombshell was that at that meeting, McMahon withdrew the WWF from the National Wrestling Alliance, meaning he had even less loyalty to Anderson and the other promoters. Also resigning was the aforementioned Jim Barnett, who was one of the stockholders of Georgia Championship Wrestling. Barnett had been forced out of Georgia after falling out with Anderson behind the scenes over several matters, including Anderson's accusing Barnett of stealing from the company. Barnett still maintained his percentage of ownership in Georgia, but in the meantime, he began assisting in the WWF's expansion, albeit quietly. With his help, McMahon gained local TV clearance in Cincinnati. Dayton, Ohio followed as McMahon and Barnett convinced the local station to cancel the Georgia program, named World Championship Wrestling, in favor of the WWF's syndicated product. Anderson also lost his hold on Dayton's Hara Arena, which signed an exclusive deal with the WWF. Shortly thereafter, McMahon began running Cincinnati and Dayton, with the renowned Andre the Giant as headliner for those early forays. But Anderson wasn't the only promoter whose plum spots McMahon gunned for. In August 1983, the Texas-based Southwest Championship Wrestling lost its Sunday morning time slot on the USA Network, in part due to inability by the territory to make its weekly payments to stay on the air, and also partly due to an especially bloody match between Tully Blanchard and Bob Sweetan that the network refused to air. McMahon began his long connection with the USA Network by swooping in and acquiring the Sunday morning time slot for his WWF, and the maiden program was named All American Wrestling. Though the WWF output on USA Network would soon grow to include the variety series Tuesday Night Titans, McMahon wasn't content with just one cable home for his product. And so, he approached Ted Turner. McMahon made an outright offer to Turner to buy World Championship Wrestling's Saturday night two-hour time slot on TBS. But his attempt at monopolizing pro wrestling on cable TV hit a major snag when Turner rejected his offer. For one thing, Turner was fiercely loyal to the wrestling on his network, especially as Georgia Championship Wrestling was there since 1972 and remained a firm anchor during his gamble to take his regional network national. A faithful Turner firmly said no to Hulk Hogan, Andre the Giant, Rowdy Roddy Piper, and the rest of McMahon's prismatic showcase. But you know how Vince is, he doesn't take rejection very well. McMahon may have not have been able to purchase the time slot from Turner, who was loyal to his Georgia territory, but what if he could acquire the territory itself? Fortunately for McMahon, there was a major dysfunction behind the scenes in Georgia, as Ole Anderson was not well liked by his peers. Brothers Jack and Gerald Briscoe owned stakes in the Georgia territory, and they had no love lost for Anderson. Gerald in particular noted that despite Georgia making good money from their own expansion into outside markets, he and Jack weren't seeing much of the windfall. Additionally, Anderson's general manner of booking and operating the territory alienated his fellow owners. In the spring of 1984, sometime after McMahon's attempt at muscling onto TBS failed, the WWF boss was contacted by Jack Briscoe over apparently unrelated matters. Before long, the enterprising McMahon began talking business, and was quite direct. Would Jack and his brother be interested in selling their shares of Georgia to him? That April, with Anderson tending to family business after the death of his mother, McMahon and his attorneys met with the Briscoes and Barnett at a hotel in Atlanta. According to the book Sex, Lies, and Headlocks, McMahon purchased their collective shares for $900,000, giving himself majority interest in the Georgia Territory. Upon learning the news, Anderson did what he could to try and legally block the sale, believing that because neither the Briscoes nor Barnett offered to first sell to another presiding stockholder, namely himself, they weren't permitted to sell their stock to an outsider. Where Anderson was hamstrung was that a majority of the shareholders, which is everybody but him, agreed to rescind that part of the buy-sell agreement, thus validating their sale of majority interest to McMahon. In the course of legal proceedings, an irate Anderson apparently turned down conciliatory offers from McMahon to come and work for him. At one juncture, Anderson recalled Vince walking up to him with wife Linda for a quick hello, to which Anderson gruffly said, you to each of them. 
Likely fuming over the remark toward his wife, McMahon told Anderson that he would never work again. Once all of Anderson's legal options were exhausted, July 7th, 1984 turned out to be the date of the final episode of World Championship Wrestling as anyone recognized it. Four days later, the contracts were finalized and McMahon absorbed the Georgia Territory, and what he coveted most, its cable time slot. And that brings us to Black Saturday. On Saturday, July 14th, 1984, the familiar face of Freddie Miller opened a World Championship Wrestling broadcast unlike any other though the home audience hadn't a clue what awaited them. In his second sentence, Achiri Miller suddenly stated, on behalf of WTBS, it's a pleasure to welcome the World Wrestling Federation. As Georgia fans at home tried to register that confusing sentence, Miller extolled the virtues of the WWF product before handing off the microphone to McMahon, who casually strolled into frame. Standing in front of the flat and globe logo that was a World Championship Wrestling staple, McMahon looked into the camera lens and promised that the WWF would deliver the most exciting product possible, while running down the gaggle of stars we were going to be seeing. The static one-shot of Vince seemed to go on forever before he finally threw things to a tape bout from Brantford, Ontario, pitting tag team champions Adrian Adonis and Dick Murdoch against the enhancement talent duo of SD Jones and Nick DiCarlo. It didn't take fans of the Georgia product long to realize that this wasn't the wrestling they'd come to love. Whereas their wrestling was all about grit, technical skill, and a permeating sense of realism, the New York style was a bit kitschier than they cared for. The emphasis on over-the-top characters, which we'd come to call sports entertainment, whether casually or derisively, was an affront to the workman-like wrestling that ruled over the time slot for over a decade. Faithful fans of the traditional Saturday Night product were outraged, and they flooded TBS with a deluge of angry phone calls and letters demanding the Superstation bring back their preferred wrestling show. But that wasn't going to be easy. After all, McMahon owned the territory through the consortium of ownership stock he'd purchased. It wasn't like Ole Anderson's show got bumped by Turner in favor of McMahon's product, and fans wanted Turner to see the error of his ways. There was no show to give the time slot back to. This was the show. It's just that McMahon gave it a makeover that the core audience found hideous. But Turner had his own reasons to be unhappy with McMahon. When Vince acquired the Georgia Territory, he and Turner came to an agreement that he would present live studio wrestling from Atlanta, the way that Anderson and those before him had. Instead, over the months ahead, McMahon used the World Championship Wrestling time slot to air pre-recorded matches from the WWF's tapings and live events. As Tim Hornbaker wrote in Death of the Territories, WWF officials believed the background crowds and noise from places like New York City, Philadelphia, and Minneapolis were important to illustrate that their promotion was indeed the big time. While McMahon may have reneged on running studio tapings in Atlanta, the WWF did bring in a number of Georgia wrestling regulars for the TBS show, including the Briscoes, Mr. Wrestling 2, and many others. And the WWF did begin mixing in some studio squash matches from Atlanta, but it wasn't enough to satiate a fed-up Ted Turner. Each man believed that the show should be done in a certain way, and Turner felt that McMahon wasn't willing to accommodate the conventions of the time slot or its loyal audience. And that audience wasn't loyal to the new guy. Ratings for World Championship Wrestling declined under McMahon's watch, another issue that understandably stuck in Turner's craw. Fans simply weren't buying what Vince was selling. Vince was quite privy to the complaints from the TBS viewers, but felt if given time, the WWF style and production could win the audience back in the end. But Turner wasn't going to give him that time. Instead, he was going to give time to others. He may not have had the power to change McMahon's show without outright cancelling it, but there was a far more creative solution in the offing. After all, TBS was his network. Who said that McMahon's wrestling was the only wrestling that could be broadcast on his station? Within months of the time slot takeover, Turner entered into negotiations with Bill Watts, the head honcho of Mid-South Wrestling. The two struck a deal for Watts to air his wrestling on TBS on Sunday afternoons. Meanwhile, Ole Anderson made his way back into the promotional game, founding the similarly named Championship Wrestling from Georgia as the continuation to his bought-off territory. Turner granted Anderson a Saturday morning time slot on TBS, with cherished announcer Gordon Soley back in on the call. McMahon was not happy with these developments. Not only because he no longer had the exclusivity he thought he'd bought into, but because both Watts and Anderson's programs began beating his TBS product in the ratings. And McMahon had other problems. The rapid expansion, talent acquisitions, and ambitious goals were taking a heavy financial toll on the World Wrestling Federation, even if Hulkamania was running rather wild by this point. The WWF had lost money in 1984, and McMahon knew that if the first WrestleMania in 1985 bombed, 
he'd likely be ruined. McMahon needed money, and so he bit the bullet. He decided to sell his TBS programming. With the help of Barnett, McMahon entered into negotiations with Carolina promoter Jim Crockett Jr., selling the time slots and production contracts to Crockett for $1 million that he really needed at the time. The legend is that after the sale was completed, a bitter McMahon rasped to Crockett, you'll choke on that million. The eventual success of that first WrestleMania, along with Crockett's payment and other helpful payments McMahon received, helped alleviate the WWF's financial uncertainty. By this point, the WWF was airing virtually nationally in syndication, and now had a third USA Network program following the addition of primetime wrestling earlier in 1985. There were also tie-ins with the immensely popular MTV that aided with the WWF's cultural growth, and a deal to begin running Saturday night's main event on NBC was coming up. He may no longer have had the TBS time slot to use as an outpost, but it's not like he really needed it. The WWF was about to reach heights that no singular wrestling entity had ever seen, TBS program or no TBS program. But that didn't end the bitterness between McMahon and Turner. McMahon's failed bid to buy the time slot outright led to his creative buy-in as showrunner. When McMahon refused to acquiesce to the tastes of the audience or Turner himself, especially when he reneged on a contract agreement, Turner reminded Vince that he was just one of many fish in a promotional sea when he surrounded himself with his rivals. After selling off the now burdensome slot to another rival, McMahon may have minimized the external damage, but his ego took a bruising. Turner and McMahon walked away feeling frostier toward each other than when they first talked business, and things got even icier three years later, when circumstances of a wrestling war led to Turner buying his way deeper into the wrestling business. But that's a story for another time.